Hello all, welcome to week six. Um, in week six we're going to further concentrate on the civil rights movement and I'm going to start week six with um, a lecture on the civil rights organizations. Now clearly they're going to come up again during my lecture. Um, this, these topics are hard to divide up because they're so connected. Um, but I felt like a background on the civil rights organizations would give you guys a more solid basis for the rest of the week. So um, many organizations formed during this period um, and before. Um, they advocated for civil rights uh, and then most of them are still around today. Okay, so what I decided to do was break this up into kind of chronological order. So we're going to approach them as they were founded. Um, and the first one then is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And that was originally founded in 1909. Um, key founding members of the organization were W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells Barnett, Mary Church Terrell, Mary White Ovington, Oswald Garrison Villard, uh, William English Walling, Dr. Henry, Henry excuse me, Moskowitz. So uh, the NAACP's principal objective is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of a minority group of citizens of the United States and eliminate racial prejudice. The NAACP seeks to remove all barriers of racial discrimination through the democratic process. Okay, and that last part of their, their kind of their, um, uh, mission statement, their statement of their principal objective is really important. Um, so through the democratic process. So they tend to focus on legal issues and ideas. Um, they do do some grassroots and protesting and um, and that kind of organizing, but honestly they're, they're often criticized during the 1960s for being more conservative in their efforts, um, for being more focused on legal issues. And as I kind of talked about last week, um, with some of the school integration, um, Brown versus Board of Education is very important, but, but in the end it takes people willing to put their lives on their line to enforce what the government has now regulated. Um, so I think that's a lot of the criticism that the NAACP faces during the 1960s for, for a time that's very radical. They're actually kind of a conservative organization. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of the founders, also founded the Crisis Magazine, which is still an official pub a publication of the NAACP, so that's very important. Um, it still discusses issues today. Um, some important civil rights participation, um, so some of the things they did during the movement, during our period, is Brown versus Board of Education. As I mentioned, they were very involved in kind of the legal aspects. Um, they had legal aid to many civil rights activists. Even if civil rights activists were not members of the NAACP, they had a legal fund where they would still help them get bail and, and deal with all kinds of legal issues that came along with fighting for your civil rights. Um, and that included the Freedom Writers. They did a lot for that organization um, of the people who did that. Um, the March on Washington, um, they're also a part of that. So some other key members during the actual civil rights movement um, and one thing you're gonna you're gonna see as we kind of um, talk about this is that uh, people were members of more than one organization. So just because you're a member of the NAACP did not exclude you from being members of other organizations. Um, so Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, uh, Medgar Evers, who I'm gonna talk about later this week, was uh, assassinated in 1963 in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, um, Marley Evers Williams, who was his widow, who after he passed went on to fight um, to continue the fight for civil rights. Uh, Roy Wilkins, Ella Baker, Thurgood Marshall, and Omzi Moore. So, and a lot of these names are going to come up again later in the week. So, just give you an idea about the NAACP. Now, I'm going to talk about the National Urban League. They are founded in 1910, and the mission of the Urban League is to enable African Americans to secure economic self-reliance, parity, power, and civil rights. So they're really important, especially in the time period they come up. Um, 
because they're found in the 1910. Now, the Civil Rights Activism of the early 20th centuries is very middle class in nature. Um, and what that means is it addresses middle class issues, which might not be the same as working class issues for African Americans, um, and for everyone, um, that, you know, the class can make a difference and they can face a different set of problems. So that's, that's a really important service that the Urban League provides. It focuses on urban areas and urban spaces and working class. Um, which makes it really different from a lot of other civil rights organizations. And it has a lot of focus on economics. Um, so jobs, living conditions, and, and those kind of, I don't want to say more practical concerns. So it's, they, they do still have concerns about political and social rights, um, but a lot of their focus is on economics. Um, and their key founding members are Mrs. Ruth Standish Baldwin, Dr. George Edmund Haynes, Professor Edwin R. A. Uh, Sliegelman, and one other thing I just wanted to say about them too is, is um, they have a focus on social work too because of the way they approach the urban concerns. A lot of their members are often social workers or sociologists or in that field. So that's also a very interesting aspect that kind of sets them apart from some of the other civil rights organizations. Um, so some of the important um, civil rights participation for the National Urban League. Um, first of all, um, you're going to notice that like the NAACP, they're a little light on the protesting and that's actually because their tax exempt status barred them from officially participating in a lot of forms of protest. Um, but what they did was they their headquarters were important for planning. Um, different heads of different organizations could meet at the National Urban League and uh, kind of plan what was going on. Um, they did fundraising for civil rights pro projects, um, including the, the Freedom Summer they helped with. They participated in the March on Washington, and they also did a voter education project, which is really important because um, one of the big problems with voting in the South was literacy tests and things like that, which prevented African Americans from maybe being able to vote. And what voter education projects did was they helped people learn how to register to vote. And I know that might seem simple and straightforward, but especially during this period, it was not. Um, a lot of the kind of um, clearness that's come to our voter process has come because of the Voter Rights, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So that changes the voting right process immensely. Um, the the largest key member was Whitney Young. Um, he was an advisor to Lyndon Johnson. Um, he participated in a lot of um, efforts to put pressure on the American government to guarantee civil rights for African Americans. Okay, so the next is the Congress of racial equality and you'll notice they all have in parentheses after them kind of their abbreviations. Some of them are used more than others. Um, this one is almost always called CORE. Um, they're founded in 1942 <clears throat> and they worked with integrating public places during the 1940s even before Brown versus the Board of Education. They were already trying to question the idea of separate uh, but equal. Um, Brown versus the Board of Education really helps provide them um, because, you know, before there's that court legal decision, um, we're talking about people who are legally arrested for trying to assert their civil rights. After Brown versus Board of Education, once desegregation starts, if you're arresting them, it's illegal, and then they have a better legal leg to stand on. So once again, I don't, I don't ever want to make it sound like I don't. I don't want to underrate the importance of the legal because they really give these groups the ability to enforce things. And so some of the key founding members were Bernice Fisher, James R. Robinson, James L. Farmer, uh, Joe Gunn, George Hauser, and Homer Jack. Um, many of the students were members of the Chicago branch of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. As I mentioned, I'm only going to 
there are so many civil rights organizations that we we could spend all week just on the organizations I am picking a few to discuss um, you guys also do a paper on this if you want to discuss some that I did not discuss that is perfectly fine uh, four is a pacifist organization seeking to change racist attitudes and their focus was very much on um, on pacifism and nonviolence, um, like a lot of the organizations during this period. Um, so some important civil rights participation that they did was to support the Montgomery bus boycott. They supported the Freedom Riders, um, the March on Washington. They were part of the Mississippi Freedom Summer, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And they also um, ran local voter registrations. So often they would almost between these organizations split up states and they would each take states and and work on um, helping local people um, and and what's important is they also I'm going to talk about this a little later with other organizations too is they developed local leadership in these areas and so that their goal was to have core members who were from that area of, of Mississippi or Georgia or Alabama um, so that they had their own kind of you know political structure some of the key members during the civil rights period were uh, James Farmer, Floyd McKissick, uh, James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman. So, and we're going to talk about these last three again because they actually become um, victims in the at the beginning of the Freedom Summer, um, and they were members of CORE who were coming down for the Mississippi Freedom Summer. Okay, so um, the next one I'm going to discuss is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or the SCLC. Uh, it's founded in 1957. Um, so the key founding members, um, the first meeting, there were about 60 African American uh, leaders. A lot of them are reference. Um, I think that's probably what SCLC is most famously known for, as being a group of ministers. Um, but they're not all ministers. Um, some of them are just, you know, the focus is on Christianity and kind of a Christian attitude towards um, embracing civil rights. And, and once again, that leads to a lot of focus on nonviolence. So some of the key ones that are at the first meeting and go on to be kind of um, the first uh, leadership of the early organization is Martin Luther King, uh, Bayard Rustin, Ella Baker, C.K. Steele, Fred Shuttlesworth, Joseph Lowry, and Ralph uh, Abernathy. Um, and actually, um, Fred, Sh Fred Shuttlesworth in particular um, lives in the South for a very long time, but he actually was um, also a minister up here. So if you're interested in local history, um, he just passed away just um, a few years ago. So there's a lot of information to be found on him in local archives in our area, and that's that's a really cool piece of local history. Um, so basic decisions made by the founders at these early meetings included the adoption of a nonviolent mass action as the cornerstone of strategy, the affiliation of local community organization with SCLC across the South, and a determination to make SCLC movement open to everyone regardless of race, religion, or background. Um, so, um, as I've said, you know, there's, there's kind of the official idea of who these organizations are. And most of that that I'm getting, especially if there are still organizations that are in effect today, I'm getting from their websites. So that's their statement of purpose. So then I'm also going to talk a little bit about what the feel was. And um, Martin Luther King was clearly one of the large leaders of the Civil Rights Movement. However, a lot of young people criticize King and SCLC. Um, for once again, like the NAACP, they didn't think it was rattled cool enough. They didn't think there was enough grassroots organizing, and they didn't think they were pushing hard enough for civil rights. Uh, you know, they uh, they were tired, and they wanted to see a change, and they wanted to see people pushing for that change. So um, they often too sometimes get get criticized for being a more conservative organization. Um, so some of their important civil rights um, participation it comes um, 
they come out of the Montgomery bus boycott. So last week I talked about the Montgomery Improvement Association and actually a lot of the key founding members come out of that. So after they're successful with the Montgomery bus boycott, there's kind of a feeling of how do we keep this going? How do we kind of turn this into something more than just the buses? I mean, that was a huge monumental victory. How do we keep, keep going? Um, and that's where SCLC really comes, is out of this idea that they want to keep going and they want to keep uh, impacting change and integration. Um, so they set up citizen schools. One of SCLC's big focus, like many of these organizations, is voter registration. And the goal of citizenship schools was to help people understand how to be able to register, how to pass the literacy test. Sometimes they would ask questions about the state constitution that were difficult to understand. Um, so that's really what these citizenship schools focus on. Um, they are clearly a huge part of the March on Washington. Um, they're part of the Selma uh, voting rights campaign in the March to Montgomery. Um, later in the, more towards the 1970s, they have the Poor People's Campaign. Um, as SCLC um, continues, they begin to address um, even more broad issues about working class rights, um, poverty, um, and I think by the end of his life, Martin Luther King really talks about um, wanting to address broad issues even of international human rights. Um, so voter registration and protests, including Birmingham um, and Martin Luther King, again, is probably most, one of his most famous things after the I Have a Dream speech is uh, letters from a Birmingham jail. So um, that comes out of the time he spends in the Birmingham jail because of the protests in Birmingham. Um, some other key members during the civil rights period, Martin Luther King, um, Bayard Rustin, Ella Baker, C.K. Steele, Fred Shuttlesworth, uh, Joseph Lowry, and Ralph Abernathy. And as I've already mentioned again with Fred Shuttlesworth, um, there's a lot of great local history there. So if you're interested in that at all, um, please be sure to check him out. So then we come to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And this is probably... I, all, all, all of these organizations I'm discussing are important, but this may be the most important organization I discussed during this lecture. Um, they're abbreviated SNCC, always called SNCC. Um, so they're founded in 1960, and the founding of theirs is really interesting because um, Ella Baker, who would worked with both the NAACP and the SCLC, was concerned. Um, that the SCLC and Martin Luther King were out of touch with young people. And as I said, um, they were critiqued for, for maybe not for being an older organization who didn't necessarily understand what young people are pushing for or how they wanted to push for it. Um, and after the Greensboro sit-ins start, um, which becomes an important protest movement against uh, segregation at lunch counters, we'll clearly talk about that later this week, um, but Ella Baker holds a meeting at Shaw University um, where basically she encourages them to stay independent from SCLC, to not become an offshoot of their organization and instead to form their own organization that will focus on what is really radical, nonviolent um, movements. Um, in the beginning, not everyone was sure nonviolence was the right way to go. Ella Baker really can encourage them to keep nonviolence as a primary idea, as a part of their organization. Um, but there was a lot of radicalism and, and they were young and they were tired of, of being mistreated. Um, so some of the key founding members are James Foreman, Bob Moses, Marion Barry, uh, Stokely Carmichael, Charles F. McDew, um, J. Charles Jones, Julian Bond, Diane Nash, James Lawson, John Lewis, Bernard Lafayette and James Bevel. So, um, their key slogan is one man, one vote. Um, they're very grassroots and very radical from the beginning. Like I said, um, they're really formed out of a sit-in movement 
and um, they're formed by young college kids who really want to make a change and want to see it happen now. Um, they will even eventually change their name in the 19, 1960s um, to reflect the move from nonviolence. They become the Student National Coordinating Committee. Um, and one thing I want to emphasize, and it's not something I'm going to get to talk a lot about in this class, it just it doesn't fit in with our overall theme and clearly there's a lot to discuss. Um, most people will associate at the move away from nonviolence to a move of violence. And while violence clearly becomes an issue, that's not their overall goal. That's not what they're hoping to achieve. Um, what they're looking for is self-defense. Um, that if people are going to come at them with guns, then they're going to defend themselves with guns. Um, I'm not saying that everyone feels that way. I'm not saying that all movements were not violent. But um, nonviolence is often confused as a switch to violence, and that's not the case. What most people are calling for when they call for a move from nonviolence is self-defense the right to defend yourself against mistreatment because nonviolence meant total nonviolence it meant no act of self-defense when arrested you can go watch videos people went limped there were training um, when we get to the Mississippi Freedom um, Summer one of the things we'll talk about is is they trained people how to deal with when people are violent with you how to react with nonviolence because that was not an easy thing to train people to do it's not your natural instinct um, so I just want to clarify that just the move from nonviolence doesn't automatically mean a move to violence that actually what most of them were arguing for was a move to self-defense which was different than nonviolence uh, 1966 Stokely Carmichael is the leader and he popularizes the term black power so awful people get this idea that there's these segregated pieces of this period there's black power and then there's civil rights movement and they're just kind of different and they're really not um, they're very connected they're very close um, and they they see similar goals um, one of the big changes is from nonviolence to the idea of self-defense um, and they eventually disbanded in the late 1960s um, so some important civil rights participation Honestly, if it was during the Civil Rights period, SNCC was probably involved. Um, they come out of the World War, Woolworth sit-ins, much like I was talking about SCLC. Um, it's kind of the core group there, plus um, lots of others. The War, Woolworth sit-ins, which I'm going to talk about later this week, become this mass movement. Um, and they become widespread across the South. People, and even in some of the northern places where people were still integrated or still segregated, they really, you know, become a national movement. Um, so they're a part of the Freedom Rides, uh, the March on Washington, uh, the Mississippi Freedom Center, the uh, summer, excuse me, the Freedom Ballot, or are sometimes called the Freedom Vote, um, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the local voter registration drives. That was probably one of their early primary things after the World War sit-ins was many of their members took active participation. They lived in the South. These are not Northerners coming to help. These are people who lived in the South and they're going into their local communities, putting their lives on the line, trying to help people register. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer, who's one of their early members, um, there's actually a video of her talking about um, the way she was beaten after she first tried to register to vote um, and her house got shut up and she got fired and just they they really faced some serious uh, persecution trying to register to vote and help others um, so some of the key members during the civil rights period uh, John Lewis Julian Bond uh, Fannie Lou Hamer who I already mentioned Bob Moses uh, Ella Baker who helped found them um, Stokely Carmichael Victoria Gray and Ann Moody um, who wrote a great book called Coming of Age in Mississippi and part of what she talks about is growing up in Mississippi but she also talks about her time with SNCC and voter registration including um, one night they spent an entire night hiding in the field behind their house um, because there were bomb threats uh, and they really, I, the KKK was supposed to come and get them and that there was 
They spent the entire night lying in the grass, fearing for their lives. Okay, so then the last one founded in 1962 is the Council of Federated Organizations, or COFO. Um, uh, originally, the name was used to secure a meeting with Ross Barnett to support the Freedom Riders in 1961, um, but then they kind of didn't do anything from 1961 to 1962. Um, and in 1962, they really kind of take shape so some of their key founding members were Mecker Evers, um, Kersey Hall, Attorney Hall, and Robert Moses. And as I mentioned, you know, just just understand that that these organizations they have some conflict, but they're not really at cross purposes, you know. And many people will belong to more than one. Um, so one of their main um, purposes was to help organize for the purpose of Mississippi Freedom Center or summer that's why Robert Moses kind of gets involved um, um, as I mentioned so there's there's all these organizations and, and we kind of think of them as this you you know united purpose but there's a lot of conflict as I as I mentioned you know some people are are criticizing some of the organizations for being more conservative. There are some people who are concerned about how radical SNCC is. Um, so it's not always easy for them to work together for a, a, a common goal. So that's kind of what COFO does, is it helps organize them in for the Mississippi Freedom Summer. Um, and they actually disband in 1965. So some important civil rights participation is the Freedom Vote the Mississippi Freedom Summer, the Freedom Schools, which are like the citizenship schools um, where they helped educate people and get them to register to vote, um, voter registration, and they also specifically call out that they have a specialization in local leadership. So their goal is not necessarily to see people come from other areas and other states, but instead to empower people who are local. And that's important because for a couple reasons. First of all, those are the people who know people who can register to vote. Um, and once they leave, there needs to be structure in place, someone to help them. Uh, some people might not have rides to, to vote on, on you know voting day. And, and they needed people behind to organize and to get elected to be local politicians. So there's a lot of, of important empowerment of local leadership in all these organizations, but COFO specifically called that out. Um, so uh, they give a space where multiple, sometimes competing organizations could work together. Um, and in that, some ways, they were almost mediators um, for these organizations so that they could work together. Um, some other key members during the civil rights period, Medgar Evers, uh, Dr. Aaron Henry, Carsey Hall, Attorney Hall, and Robert Moses. Um, and I know that, that the that my two lists are very similar, but they're really mostly prominent during this period for a period, as you can see, of like three years, but really important. Um, so my conclusion uh, for this lecture is that the civil rights movement involved a lot of important organizations, and these are just some of them. Um, many are still around and still fighting for civil rights here and internationally. Um, and hopefully this will give you, like I said, a background so that as I talk about these organizations all week, um, you guys will know who I'm talking about and you can kind of refer back to the lecture for who they are. This is my reference slide. Like I said, a lot of this comes from if they're an organization still today, they have their own websites and they have their own history. And it's really great to kind of go and read their perspective on their founding. Uh, thanks, guys. Have a great week.